Hi, I'm Hector Del Castillo, and I'm organizer of Business Intelligence Chef DC and founder of Bold PM. Today's topic is Top Strategic Technology Trends for 2022. In today's discussion, we're going to talk about the what experts are saying are going to be emerging technologies that will be not only emerging and, and actually growing very quickly in 2022, but also will be growing and expected to continue to grow for the next decade. And we're going to talk about a couple of different studies and reports that have been published by McKenzie and company, as well as Gardner. And we're going to draw from this material to actually start looking at the combination of technology that both of these organizations are saying will be actually growing very quickly and the impact to the different industries uh, that are right now um, kind of trying to redefine themselves post COVID-19. This discussion will focus on answering this question. What are technology trends that are, that are, that we need to watch and why should I care if I'm in a specific industry or if I'm working within a specific organization today, why should I care about this technology? Because we're not necessarily using it today within our organizations. Or furthermore, our customers or users aren't using them either. But I want to ask a question. What if your customers are early adopters and you are not as an organization? How long do you think you're going to keep those customers and users that you have today? That is the question and the uh, sort of like the enigma of most organizations, because if they tend to be sort of like late adapters or even laggards in the way that they uh, behave, this is where, you know, Amazon.com comes in, a brand new company, and in 20 years becomes a multi-billion dollar organization, and its CEO becomes the um, highest paid or the most has the most net worth in the planet compared to any other billionaires. And that's exactly what happens to uh, organizations that um, are early adopters of technology. When they really focus on adopting very early on, not one, but multiple technologies and create something that hasn't existed before. They use that creativity and purpose in order for them to achieve much faster growth than anybody else in the market has up until then. So we're gonna focus on these technologies because if you are in an organization or you're thinking about starting or going to an organization that is an early adopter of technologies so that you can actually get in the game of creating a market very quickly or scale um, your adopters very quickly. This is the, the, the whole purpose of today's discussion. And what we're gonna talk about is our current situation. You know, what just happened in 2021? Uh, to me, it was kind of a blur because I spent the entire year, it seems, right in front of my webcam, <laughs> just like I am right now. But there's a lot of things that went on, and we we're going to talk about specifically what, what we're going to do about that. Now, the other thing is we're going to talk about some of these technology trends that are uh, being discussed from these two reports that I mentioned earlier, which are McKenzie and Gardner. And we're going to talk about key takeaways, and then we'll have a Q&A. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, be sure to type them into the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Let's get into current situation. So current situation, what happened in 2021? Year eight in review. Well, yes, some organizations grew. Others were sort of like trying to find their, their place in the market after you know this huge change in buyer behavior and adoption occurred because of COVID-19. There was a lot of change. The way we interact with customers, the way we interact with our peers, we're not necessarily face-to-face, -face, but we're interacting more and more digitally, um, not just on our phones. It's pretty much any mobile device. And we're using applications like Zoom, for example. And that was a big change. And it was a big win for Zoom, by the way, because they were the, the fastest growing application in 2020 and 2021. We're all searching for a brighter tomorrow. We're all looking for the next normal that is better than the old normal. <laughs> and definitely we want something that is different from the way it's been for the last couple of years. So here's what many are saying. Year in review, and if you look at a McKenzie publication that talks about you know, just year in review, say these are the four different themes that came out of 2021. And it's not just for US, this is globally. We're all tired of the ongoing pandemic. You know, We're on the what, fifth wave? I, I've lost count. But uh, certainly I'm, I'm now 
craving to actually have more human interaction that I haven't had because I'm kind of limited with uh, trying to keep my bubble here uh, where I'm at and keeping everybody around me safe. But also, if you're an organization and if you're an organization that has been sort of like trying to figure out how to keep your talent, it is an ongoing issue. At the second half of, of 2021, many organizations started losing workers, key employees in record numbers, something like over 40 million people in U.S. switch jobs. And if this was almost overnight and even today, what's lingering from that, people are just right out quitting, even without having a job lined up after that, because they're just fed up with their environment and their situation. And they just are saying, this is not worth it. I'm out of here. And that's what they're doing. They're just quitting. And that's been a challenge for organizations, especially when their workers are needed to actually continue to uh, be able to keep up with growing demand from their customers and their users. And it is happening in certain technology areas. Digital dominates the growth agenda. Across everything, you're now seeing that a fast, very quick adoption and acceleration to become more and more digital even for those businesses that have been sort of like lagging at transforming and having some sort of e-commerce model, because as soon as post COVID-19 hit and the economy shut down, all of us started buying more and more online. And we're still seeing that. Um, now we're seeing at the tail end, some churn from organizations that haven't figured out. Yes, they do have subscription models now, but many of the subscribers are quitting. And that's impacting companies like Netflix and other companies like Netflix who have some sort of SaaS model where they have different kinds of subscriptions. And those subscriptions, you know, they're not really achieving what their subscribers really thought they would. And they're just leaving in numbers. And it's impacting all sorts of organizations, not just Netflix. And then also sustainability gains steam. And we're going to talk about specifically clean technologies and their impact in the next decade. What we foresee is going to impact all sorts of and the industries that they're going to be deeply impacting in the next 10 years. Figure out if you're a product vendor, if you're in a product vendor organization and products can be services as well. So any, anyone that has some sort of commercial offering that is being sold and that's how you're making revenue. These are the challenges that you faced. Any combination of these 10 different challenges is what you've seen from delayed or lost sales revenue to cancellations in orders to maybe changing customer needs and priorities to change in the way you interact with your customers and users because you're not face-to-face -face anymore necessarily. And then you'll see disrupted launches because you're either delaying or canceling launching of new products and then also delayed milestones from your products in addition to less people in your team to work with because they're leaving in droves perhaps, and also new remote collaboration requirements, supply chain disruptions, and that's what everybody is blaming today as to why we're paying more for gas and everything else we buy at the grocery store, because now we're seeing inflation kicking in and there's no stopping it, and then changing competitive landscape. Your competitors are have brand new competitors or you people that you thought, organizations that you didn't think were competitors, guess what? They're now competing because they took away your some of your most valuable customers today. And now you're trying to figure out how to play catch up to those organizations that you didn't consider would become your com competitors. These are all the challenges that in a combination of these, this is what we, we've heard across industries regarding uh, what type of organization you are when you are a commercial, privately held, or, or public organization that has some sort of commercial offering. And this is not just impacting U.S. companies, it's, comp it's impacting companies everywhere around the globe. So Gardner, you know, says, hey, you know, we did a survey and we did the survey, oh, but fair warning, we surveyed these CEOs before Omicron wave started, and here's what we heard from them, right? So late 2020, they published this report saying, here's what CEOs have top of mind in 2022. Growth is number one. And a close number two is it, I continue to accelerate and become even more digital as a business. And this is where IT modernization and legacy 
modernization of legacy systems that are not cloud-based today is what's continuing to uh, occur through the rest of 2022. And the whole reason why they want to do this is because that's where they need to actually grow faster than their competitors who maybe were born in the cloud. These are brand new companies that all everything they do is they're using 100% cloud-based applications and a much bigger competitor that has legacy systems that are not cloud-based, they're having issues keeping up with much smaller, more nimble and agile, smaller competitors. And it's for them, it's all about increasing operational efficiency across everything, not just on the sell side, on the supply side, and also in how they manage and how they implement internal activities that need to be done in order to continue adding value to their organizations. And here's what one of the partners at McKenzie has said. This crisis, this post-COVID-19 crisis, has forced every single organization, no matter what industry you're in, to get into, begin a massive experiment as, as to how the organization can become more nimble, more flexible, and faster at what you do, and be able to maintain your operational efficiency and continue to improve the quality of what you deliver and to whom you deliver it and ensure that you maintain the speed and make sure that you're tracking demand. And when there's a change in demand, you're accelerating when there's a lot more demand, you're slowing down when there's less demand, and then you're looking for opportunities to acquire new customers. And that is part of any business that wants to continue to grow. Growth can be any combination of these three things that I just spoke about. Retaining current customers, upselling and cross-selling to those customers, but also acquiring new customers. Both of them have to be done by anyone who wants to grow. And here's the same report from Gardner is saying that the top priorities does include lots of data and analytics use cases across everything they do from having a more significant, bigger footprint in e-commerce to being able to track across everything, like actually start managing their supply chain much better, start managing their internal resources, including workers that are now no longer in a same location. They're now remote. Most of them are working remotely and we'll be doing that for perhaps the majority of this year as well. And actually that's what most employees are looking for in many sectors, they want to be have the ability, even after this pandemic is done, to continue working remotely because they're fed up with commutes and they don't want to commute anymore. And all of this, you have to be able to maintain the efficiency of everything that you do, your, the way you work, your processes that you follow to ensure that you continue to engage and deliver the right experience to your customers and users. And just suffice to say that doing all of these things that are top priorities, the top four here, they all will require a combination of better data management, faster analytics, and automation through artificial intelligence. And that's what is going to drive growth in the area of data and analytics across industrial sectors. So here's what... Uh, Peter Diamand is this, also says about the pace of technolog technological change. It's accelerating. What he's saying is that in the next decade, between 2020 and 2030, we will see more progress in new technologies than we've seen in the last 100 years. So think about what just, you know, what you're familiar with happened between 1920 and 2020. That's 100 years ago, right? Well, Whatever we know, in the, it's going to happen in the next 10 years. New things coming up that we don't know about. You know, what happened in the last 100 years? We had the telegraph, radio, television, the internet, and dot, 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 all these different things. Transistor, fiber optics, all communications. And, you know, the, all of that happened in the last 100 years. Now we're going to see that in the next 10 years, between now and 2030. And the start of that is what we're going to talk about specifically, because we need to find, you know, how are we going to benefit or how our organizations that we work with going to benefit from these fast paced technological changes that are going on and projected to happen in the next decade 
So we're going to talk about the top 10, uh, the top technology trends, not top 10, top technology trends, because they're not necessarily 10, they're more than that. But we're going to talk about just the broader technologies that we're going to see adoption from. And the first one is a report from McKenzie, and that was published in 2020. And typically, every beginning of a decade, which 2020 was the beginning of a decade, yes, we know that we were all caught up in the pandemic, but 2020 began a new decade, and this new decade is projecting that this all these changes will occur between now and 2030. McKenzie published this report that was actually announced at the World Economic Forum and at various different summits that um, the World Economic Forum holds around the world. So these are global trends, not just US. And you see here 10 different technologies that are going to be growing at a very quick, quick rate, creating new companies, new business models that haven't been before. And many of these products are right now in their infancy if they're commercially available today because there's a few early adopters, but not the majority of the market. So number one, next level process automation. So being able to get into the industrial internet of things, industrial automation and robots and cobots, collaborative robots being used for industrial applications across all different sectors of manufacturing. The way that your next electric vehicle is going to be made is probably completely different than how Teslas are being made today. And completely new assembly lines than whatever we know or understand, companies like GM and Ford and others have been using for a long time. They're all been announced that they're now in the process of re of modernizing their, their manufacturing plants for the next set of electric vehicles because all these companies have announced that they're going to stop producing fossil fuel-based uh, vehicles and they're going to put all their billions of, of investment in the next decade in coming up with electric vehicles that will compete with companies like Tesla and others that already are in market with electric vehicles. So your next vehicle, probably my guess is going to be an electric vehicle. And actually, um, my wife and I just recently made a pledge that that's going to be so. Our next vehicles are going to be an electric vehicle. doesn't matter what brand it is, that's our next car. And we've been holding off to try to figure out what is the right fit, uh, the car that has the electric vehicle that will have the right fit for our lifestyle and the right price point for us. That may take some time, but well, that's what we're pledging to do. Also, future of connectivity. The way we connect is going to be completely different, right? Zoom is one of these new applications that, well, has been around for, and it was actually a company that got started less than 10 years ago. And in less than 10 years, they actually became a multi-billion dollar valued company, publicly traded today, and it's worth tens of billions of dollars. Zoom communications is what I'm talking about. So that's part of the future of connectivity. More companies... And specifically, what's driving this is the deployment of 5G wireless networks and connecting everything that is going to be internet, some widget that is connected to the internet for the part of the internet of things. Distributed infrastructure, part of that would be figuring out how to modernize your infrastructure in the way that is decentralized, sort of like the power grid needs to be decentralized so that you don't have a single point of failure. That's the same thing that you want to do in the way you architect the infrastructure within your business for internal use. And how do you do that? Because you might need multiple data centers and you might need multiple cloud service providers and be able to communicate no matter what. So you have full redundancy and you ensure that there is no way to drive any kind, anything that drives to stopping your business or disrupting your business from operating the way it should be. Next generation computing, Intel announced that they're now creating the next generation of microprocessors. You know, whatever we think is microprocessors today, going to be very different what Intel is already starting to work on. And they're going to actually start powering our mobile devices in the next five years and deployed globally. Applied artificial intelligence is the next one. Future of programming, the trust architecture. We're going to talk more about what that trust architecture is because it's not just about securing assets. It's about making sure that we are ensuring that 
everyone that is accessing information is the right person and is a trustworthy person. And we eliminate any bad actors, even if they are um, sort of like negligent or forgetful bad actors because they were hacked by somebody else and now they're using their assets to get to to your to your corporate organization's uh, digital assets. We're going to have to have more of that, and that's going to be through a lot of multi-factor authentication that is transparent and seamless to users. And all of this is going to be new technologies that will be adopted in the next, in the next few years. And it's key because if you can't trust who you're talking to because you think it's somebody, somebody and they're posing as somebody else, when trust goes away, everything stops. And you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then there are three that are industry specific. In other words, these are the first seven that I just mentioned are going to have very broad implications across industrial sectors today. These other ones are going to have deep, deep impact on specific types of industries. So for example, the bio revolution, that is going to be healthcare and pharma and the way that vaccines and new medicines and new therapies are created. It's this revolution of biotechnology and all the tools, all the, uh, all the different supplies, and even new platforms as to how vaccines are created. And even further, how we are actually avoiding certain illnesses by doing some uh, bioengineering at the genetic level. All of this is part of that bio revolution. Next generation materials. And this is all from nano materials. Things that we kind of hear about in science fiction movies today, these microbots that can repair and do other things, not just to human tissue, but also other inorganic uh, things have these microbots that will you know, do repair of anything that can break down or wear out over time through use. And that's next generation materials, everything from textiles to how, you know, what materials that we use to make things that we use to the way we uh, will we'll do all of these things. These are all material science to the next level. And then finally, the future of clean technologies. And I rather think that 10 is not just industry specific. I'm sorry, but I think that's also broad. And I'll just explain why in a, in a minute. I will get into that more. But clean technologies are going to emerge as well because everybody right now in the world is has committed, at least through the latest uh, Kyoto Agreement, that they're going to be looking at ways to become net zero compliant, which means you've got to reduce and become neutral in the way that in whatever your operations are, that you eliminate the generation of more greenhouse gases. And that's what everybody has committed to in the, in the next few decades. And there's going to be a lot of innovation, a lot of new technologies that need to be developed, all getting to the point where we're trying to focus on how every single organization, no matter what they do, they become net zero and neutral as far as emission of greenhouse gases. So a little bit of, of more about each one of these the, from the same report, the effects of any of these technologies, you know, you know, number one, next level of process automation and virtualization, you know, they expect that 50% of today's work activities will be, could be automated by 2025. And if you think uh, that your, your job become redundant, not so. We're talking about that most organizations that are gonna do this right, are looking to not replace humans with technology. They're looking to enhance current workers, human beings, through the use of new technologies. So think about um, someone like has an exoskeleton that now can lift much bigger things and much heavier things because of the use of some something that you are wearing or that you that that you put on that allows you to do things that normally you couldn't do before. And all of these things are going to come with different types of collaborative robots from artificial intelligence to chatbots to listening bots to all of these things that will have AI behind them. That's what this is all about. And all of these are 
the range of things that in the McKenzie saying, this is why these 10 different things are going to be so crucial for us to continue development and is speeding up new businesses, new organizations, new business models that get into very specific, uh, so solving very specific problems that exist industry by industry. And it's going to spawn a lot of the businesses that will specialize in any combination of these 10 different things. Because none of these are self-exclusive. In other words, they don't, they're not standalone technologies. You need to get and you use creativity to figure out what combination of technologies will benefit the most because it's not one, it will be maybe a set of any of these technologies that will benefit and will maximize the impact to your organization to figure out how to continue to remain relevant and continue to deliver much higher value to your current, to your customers and users and continue to do so in the future as well. So disruptions across these seven that are that, that you see is that you know there's a lot of self-learning and reconfigurable robots that can actually will need, learn over, over time and somebody needs to train them. And that trainer is going to be a human being. And those will be the ones that will actually be training certain types of robots into doing things on their own. And that's going to make some, that's going to take some time. You think you see if you see these robots that you've seen from um, uh, Boston uh, ro Robotics, this Boston company that actually has these robots that you know do all these uh, videos with music and they're dancing and all that stuff. And these are not that not necessarily being controlled. They actually have learned to do these routines with some sort of artificial intelligence that is in them. Well, you know they still have some some issues like you know you need to recharge them for hours and they can only operate for a few hours at a time. All those things, they need to solve those problems before this actually becomes a more viable set of technologies that can do what we think they can do because we've all seen some sort of science fiction movie or show that you know says, oh yeah, it's already done. And when it's actually a lot of work to get them to work the way they're behaving in that story or that movie that you're watching. Future of connectivity. 5G technology that are right now being implemented and probably right now, pretty quickly, we're going to see 5G and maybe the talk about a 6G because I think that, you know, we're probably going to see a lot more uh, need for bandwidth over wireless over the air to actually start seeing um, more and more gadgets that are used um, by most of us in the market for different purposes. More mobile devices and more different types of mobile devices that allow us to not just connect with each other, but interconnect with other machines and be able to get us the information at the palm of our hands, no matter what type of device we have in our hand. And distributed infrastructure is part of being able to uh, go to the next level of whatever cloud services and cloud equipment that we need to actually drive more adoption of cloud-based and web-based applications that we're all going to need, not just at the individual level, consumers, but also at the organizational level that will drive the next generation of companies that will be working in solving some of these problems when there's a need uh, or a market there to, uh, to, to do, to actually uh, win. Also, continuing on with the other four, next generation computing, I mentioned Intel and, uh, and uh, other companies like Intel are driving this business right now. So our next generation of laptops and mobile devices will have a next generation type of microprocessors that will think faster, will actually have much more memory in, a, in the same volume of space or maybe even at a smaller uh, volume of space and will power our mobile devices in the future. And applied AI. And part of it is that if it's going to be applied AI, it's going to be everything from being able to do pattern recognition, optical pattern recognition to natural language processing, being able to take my speech and very quickly put the captions that you're seeing at the bottom of the slide. All those things are the things that we need more applied AI. And future of programming means that now we may not have human beings developing code. We may have actual bots developing code in a way that can be audited. In other words, that you can follow along exactly what they've done because every single change and every single line is clearly documented, has already built in metadata 
that says the purpose of that particular code. How many programmers are out there in the crowd that, and how well do you document your code? It's not necessarily the best uh, approach right now. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of coders, and the more coders there are, the less clear the code becomes over time especially when you have to play, apply change upon change upon change because of all the bugs or defects that are found either before you launch the product or by your customers after you launch the product. All of these things are now need to be audited in a way that in future of programming, all of these things will be automatically tagged. A new line comes in and automatically comments, everything is commented saying, why is this here? When did it happen? And when did it change? And what was the last time? And who was it changed by? And for what purpose? All of that will be included as part of your code in the future. That is the future of software 2.0. Trust architecture. Cybersecurity will continue because there's a lot of still increasing ransomware attacks that lead to a standstill of current organizations that didn't consider the fact that somebody was going to actually hack it into their systems and hold their data for ransom and often they have to go back to paperwork um, as they did a few years ago that's not going to be a, a, a good situation for most organizations so now you're trying to figure out how to avoid that by having systems that are smarter in the way they will actually detect any kind of intrusion and prevent any kind of current um, you know what are you called advanced persistent threats by bad actors that want to come in and either take your intellectual property out from your, your data that is intellectual property to your organization or maliciously wants to do something to take away your the data that your organization depends on to run and try to um, break your business and disrupt your business by stopping it uh, through some sort of ransomware attack. All of that is going to be worked on. And then finally, the last three, and I want to expand more on the future of technologies. So now let me shift because I also mentioned that there's another report by Gardner and Gardner mentions 12 of these technologies, but they're actually divided into three broad applications or use cases, you know, the larger storyboards that will impact. Uh, and typically what they, they, they uh, are typically for any kind of anyone who is in the information technology uh, side of things. Uh, because all of these are about, you know, cloud-based applications and things that will depend on the internet and the next evolution of the internet. And of course, data and data management and analytics are all included in here. We're going to lump it into three different things. And the first one is called engineering trust. And engineering trust entails um, the emergence of data fabrics Cybersecurity mesh, it's basically a fabric just made to start monitoring all of your data and the way it flows and the way it goes from one point to another to ensure that they can keep any intruders out that were not supposed to be there and be able to detect and then um, of, you know basically take them out of, of, of your having access to your network. And then privacy enhancing computation as well as cloud native platforms. And there's a lot of that right now going on because most organizations that were uh, already leading in digital transformation, they're already at the point where they're saying, we're completely taking all of our legacy systems and moving them to the cloud in the next five years. And that's gonna happen this decade, not next decade this decade. And so all of this is about figuring out how to ensure that cloud, your cloud networks, because you might have access to multiple overlaid networks that are all up in the cloud are actually secure. And monitoring and managing that is going to be a task in itself. And that's what engineering trust is all about. These four different things are all working together to increase how trustworthy your network is and how to ensure that everyone that is using your network when these are corporate networks are the right people that should have the right access and there are no bad actors trying to take away your data or drive your business into and disrupt your business. The second piece and the second theme is 
sculpting change. And this is all about changing into the next, whatever is next for your organization and your industry. Things like composable applications. These are applications that you can quickly build without having to code or without, you know, you can integrate without you actually having to code, write code to connect applications and don't, don't normally talk together. Just having available APIs and uh, supported APIs that as they change, your connectors and the way you interconnect between one application to another also is maintained so that your communication between applications that are needed for your operations within your business still continue even as there are changes in the interfaces between applications. Decision intelligence, hyper automation. I mentioned that as part of industrial automation. Hyper automation is some of that. The adoption of more different types of bots for different purposes to actually help you run your business faster and much more effective at a much more efficient pace. And then AI engineering. This is no different than what we mentioned earlier from the McKinsey report as well. And then finally, accelerating growth. And to accelerate growth, it's not just e-commerce. We're talking about having completely different experiences for not just your customers and users, but also for the workers within your organization, when now they're probably gonna be working in the metaverse of your organization, as opposed to them having to commute, they're gonna be working from home and working in a room that is all virtual room, probably wearing their immersive goggles and they're going to be next to each other, even though I'm here and the other person may be in Brazil or in India or some other part of the world. And when we gather, we're all going to be gathering in the same room, interacting with each other without it being next to each other. Those are total experiences. And that's going to be uh, impacting not just customers, but also how you work and also how you interact with partners and suppliers on the supply side. So total experience is all around for a business, not just the customer side, but also the way you manage your people, your workers, and the way you manage your entire supply chain, including your partners. Auto, auto, autonomic uh, systems as well, and generative AI. These are all things that are needed to accelerate growth within different types of organizations. So that's uh, three areas, Gartner, 12 technologies, many of them overlap with McKenzie, and that's the reason why I went, because when you compare the, those 12 to the 10 that I that I mentioned earlier, they're pretty much all overlapping, right? So there's agreement between the two different vendors about, you know, what are the technologies that are going to be you know, growing very quickly and a lot of changes coming up in the next decade. Going back to the McKenzie report, uh, we're talking about specifically what are the things that, that you know, how are they going to use? But what they're saying is that it's not one but a combination of any of these 10 technologies that's going to create synergy that allows organizations to not just have linear growth, they're going to have exponential growth. And through creativity, it is those organizations that figure out what is the right combination of technologies for their customers and how to actually uh, combine them in a way that they can grow much quicker than anyone else in the market, including their competition and a lot of creativity needed in order to figure out the right technologies to pick and how to integrate them together to get that exponential growth. But this is going to launch new types of businesses in the next decade, according to McKinsey. And it doesn't matter what you wanna do, you just have to figure out of these 10 building blocks of technologies, what is the right combination? And you might want to get your business started or you may want to look for the right company that you want to work for where you can actually grow and use your current expertise and build additional expertise about these new technologies that they're using already for the future. So Meta is one of these companies that Facebook owns, their majority owner of Meta, creating the metaverse today using these immersive goggles for different things from being able to work collaboratively, even though you're everybody's remote, to having some sort of gaming experience that is much better than nobody else can do, to even like being an, an immersive experience in the way you go to, you wouldn't go to a theater anymore. 
you would go to a place where you can just put on your goggles and then watch this immersive experience, this movie that is just an immersive experience because you're not just watching it and, and, and uh, hearing it. You're actually embedded in it, maybe as a free character that, you know, you're transparent and seamless to everybody else and just looking at what's going on person to person. Or perhaps you may have, you know, improv where you're part of that and you're actually a, a, a play character in that, uh, just like you would do in any gaming experience. These are all things that will actually create new industries and new experiences that we don't have today. Here's the impact. I want to kind of focus on this because these 10 technologies will have different range of impacts. And here's what uh, McKenzie identified in the same report, you know, how healthcare sector is going to actually be impacted by any combination of these 10. And the blue is there, it means there's a major influence of that in that particular sector. The salmon or pink, whatever you want to call that color, is moderate influence. And then the White is limited influence in that specific sector. So you can see here that healthcare sector is strongly influenced by things like AI, connectivity, the bio revolution, which I talked about earlier, uh, next generation of computing, trust architecture, because you want to secure assets, and then future of programming, because yeah, you're going to have to program. And maybe it's about programming some sort of genetic sequence to be produced or fabricated. Mobility sector. Mobility sector is also about automotive, the way we, um, you know, right now, whatever vehicle we get to either um, take ground-based transportation or air-based transportation, all of that will change. And what's going to impact that the most is automation, AI, connectivity, and programming, as well as distributed infrastructure. There's talk that in the next couple of years, we will actually start seeing air taxis, meaning these are vehicles that we can take that are not just a car, they're actually airplanes or helicopters and they can take us from point A to point B without having to take a highway. That's gonna be exciting. And probably redefining commute as we know it today. <laughs> Industry 4.0 sector. This is industrial automation. And again, you can see the impacts there. And then the enabler sectors are for pretty much everything that creates infrastructure from data centers to uh, communication systems and communication networks that need to be interlinked and, and connected with each other and build more capacity up and down as needed based on what's happening and being able to take data and be able to drive data from one point to another where you need it, when you need it, because your workforce may be more mobile in the future than ever before. And those are all things that will enable across the different sectors. Going back to the clean technologies that I spoke about earlier, another report and article from McKenzie states that clean technologies will impact these particular sectors. And the reason why is because of this Kyoto agreement that just was signed. And there's been multiple yearly conventions that these governments, including private sector entities, get together to figure out how are we going to get there? How are we going to get to net zero emission of greenhouse gases? And it's going to impact the way we power our electrical devices. It's going to impact the way we manufacture anything that we are buying today as consumers or as organizations. It's going to impact the way we move mobility from automobiles to bicycles, to scooters, to airplanes, all of that will be impacted trying to figure out how to get to net zero. A lot of innovation, a lot of creativity needed to figure out what is the right combination of technologies needed to actually get to net zero emissions. Buildings, agriculture, forestry, waste management, all of these things will be impacted and will need to change in order to get to the net zero emission objectives that governments have set for later in this decade. And executives need to wonder, these are the three questions that they need to ask. How important is this trend for my specific industry or my organization or company today? And how fast do we need to react? Are those changes happening very quickly? Are our customers uh, early adopters? 
are our people early adopters and do we have the right talent right now to be able to deal with this new technologies that we need to have in order to get to where we need to be in the next three to five years. And then also, how do you approach the technology implementation? How do we implement that? And a lot of technology talent that you will need within organizations that is new talent because these are new technologies, not your current workers. So you will need to figure out how to bring in that talent and retain it until you're actually able to get the benefits of being able to produce something that works for you and for your customers and users. Part of this is figuring out, you know, how are you going to get the most benefit? And the combination will come from figuring out, you got to pay attention to your business model. You got to pay attention to your current organizational capabilities and your current capacity, being able to not only retain your current workers, but then attract new workers and retain them for as long as you need them in order to continue having a a solution to where the future is going today. Not aiming to where you are today, but where you believe the future will be for your company in the next five to 10 years. And you got to bring in that talent early, not late, because it's going to be more expensive if you try try to play catch up later on. As most organizations that accelerated their digital transformation found out um, when they needed to just go digital when they were completely non-digital to begin with. And a lot of outdated legacy systems that are still, they're still clinging to today. And so these five different areas are things that are key for any organization to get the maximum benefits from working or using, adopting any of these 10 technology trends that we're talking about. You got to look at the business model and, you know, do you have the right business model? How does it need to evolve? You know, how is your community and uh, the world going to think of you if you do this? And are you keeping up the promise of what you need to do in order to become net zero compliant? And what is the operational risk to your business? What type of compliance issues do you have to deal with? And what are which ones of those are new? Because now you're going to get uh, penalty fees if you are producing more greenhouse gases than you should be because that probably will be coming where somebody's actually tracking how much your you know how much how, how much greenhouse um, gases your business is producing and take the legal risk away uh, being able to have the right agreements the right uh, people in place and the right uh, agreements in place for everyone around you whether it's your suppliers your partners your workers in addition to your customers if you're a, a b2b type of business or even if you're selling into consumer markets, making sure that you're um, checking all those things that are relevant to you that are key to maximize the benefits of adopting any of these technologies. So key takeaways real quick, I spoke about the 10 different trends that McKinsey is projecting will be surging in the next decade, not just 2022, but 2021 onwards to 2030. um, Gardner, the 12 different things that have to do with those three different themes that I spoke about earlier. And finally, going back to sustainability and how important it is, there's also a video that you can watch on your own uh, from Bill Gates because he, uh, I think it was about a year ago, he wrote this book called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And what he's saying is that we're reaching the already the the time where it's going to be passed to try to reverse a lot of the impact that you're already seeing as these major radical superstorms are forming, no matter whether it's summertime or wintertime or in between. And we're seeing more and more of this weather phenomena that we haven't seen before. And it's all connected to the fact that we've been producing way too much greenhouse gases for decades, because that's what we spent in ever since the Industrial Revolution of the early 20th century. So with that, I'd like to offer questions. And I want to start by asking you, uh, the audience, this question. Of these technologies that I spoke about, given what you know, if you're within your organization or if it's for personal use, which of these technologies do you think will make the most impact in your lives or in your organization today in the next three years? If you can just kind of type that via the chat, 
I would like to see what your answers are. I want to tell you a little bit more about Bolpium Academy. So Bolpium is my company. It's a, a product management consulting firm. We're actually putting together live online uh, and on-demand workshops as well. And it's they're all available from the Bolpium Academy. You can actually go to the link at the bottom of the slide and uh, see if there's anything that might interest you. If you're looking to grow your skills, uh, you can actually go there and see how you can actually consume this as live online or on-demand courses available to you. A little bit more about my my company. Uh, we inspire the next generation of product leaders within organizations to help them figure out how to turn ideas into valuable profitable products for their organizations. And here is my contact information as well. Really have enjoyed today's discussion. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank you for listening and, and uh, being here today. And I hope to see you same, same channel next month in March for our next upcoming session. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And thanks so much. Have a great rest of your week.